What's going on guys, my name is Matt and I am back with a new PC build. This time the price point is $400 and for that price you're getting a very capable gaming PC with all new parts including a dedicated graphics card. This is going to be a full build guide meaning I'm not only going to be showing you each of the parts and talking about why I picked them, but I'm also going to be showing you how to put everything together step by step. And then finally I'm going to be showing you both gaming and streaming benchmarks because believe it or not this $400 PC is pretty darn good at streaming. Now there are obviously a bunch of different ways you could have spent this budget, but I did my best to go with parts that will give you a good base for PC gaming with lots of options for upgrades in the future. But before we get any further, I want to take a minute to talk about the sponsor of today's video, Opera Desktop. Opera is the browser I use and is designed with tech enthusiasts in mind. It features an ad blocker, tracker blocker, and VPN built in, no add-ons or plugins required. You get custom speed dials that automatically reroute you to tech websites, and Opera's toolbar gives access to ChatGPT ready to go at any moment which is super convenient. Opera is free and ultra customizable with tech themed wallpapers and tons of other options. One of my favorite things to enable is this forced dark theme on pages option that basically forces dark mode on all the web pages you visit. I've been using Opera for over a month now and have really been enjoying all the built in tech centric features. You can get Opera by heading the link in the description and downloading it is a 100% free way to both support the channel and try out an awesome new browser. So thanks again to Opera Desktop for sponsoring this video and now let's get into talking about each of the parts that make up this $400 gaming beast. When parting out a system I like to start with the CPU as other than the graphics card this has the biggest impact on gaming performance and determines a number of other factors with the build. With a build this inexpensive the best option in my opinion is the Intel Core i3 12100F. This is a 4 core 8 thread CPU running on the Intel 7 lithography with base and boost clocks of 3.3 and 4.3 GHz respectively this little i3 is packing a decent amount of multi thread performance for gaming. Beyond this because it's a 12th gen CPU it means you have a ton of great upgrade options in the future if you find you want more CPU horsepower. One of my favorite things about this CPU is the fact it comes with a pretty decent stock cooler in the box. This is Intel's new stock cooler design that looks fantastic in my opinion and offers more than enough cooling performance for this i3. It features a copper slug with a decent sized aluminum heatsink and it looks way sleeker than the old design. Sure, aftermarket coolers are nice but the fact this comes free in the box means we're able to save money in this area to use in other parts of the build. For the motherboard I went with a very solid budget option in the form of this Gigabyte H610M S2H. This board has all the features we need like two DIMM slots for our RAM, an Ultra M.2 slot for our SSD, 16x PCIe slot for our graphics card, and even an additional 1x PCIe slot that can be used for the optional Wi-Fi card that I'll be talking about later in the video. The VRMs are decent and should be enough for you to upgrade to a locked i5 or i7 in the future. The back panel IO is also pretty good and for $90 this board is offering some decent value. Going for a board with 4 DIMM slots and more PCIe slash M.2 expansion would have been nice, but after looking at all the available boards this seems to be the best option that will fit within the budget. Moving on to RAM, I went for a pretty safe pick in the form of this 16GB kit of XPG Z1 DDR4 RAM. It's running at 3200MHz CL16 so speeds and timings are very optimal for a budget build like this one and at only $35 it's a great value. This is also a dual stick kit meaning it will be running in dual channel operation for max performance. 16GB is enough for modern budget gaming and streaming, but if you have it in the budget you can spend about $20 more and get the 32GB kit if you want. RAM is super cheap right now and these low memory prices are part of the reason you can build a new gaming PC for so cheap. Another area where prices are really low right now is flash storage. For this build I went with the 512GB silicon power A60 SSD. This is a gen 3 NVMe drive in the ultra compact M.2 form factor meaning installation takes seconds. It's plenty fast for a gaming PC and at only $24 it's offering a ton of value. 512GB should be enough for your OS, applications and a modestly sized games library but this is another area where you may want to spend a little more if you have it in the budget as the 1TB model is only about $12 more. 
The next part is the one many of you have probably been wondering about, which is the graphics card. Like I said, the system is using a new, dedicated graphics card, and to do that, I had to get a little creative. What I went with is an RX 580 8GB from AliExpress, which is currently only selling for $66 new. Now this is the 2048 SP version that performs a little worse than a standard RX 580, but for under $70 and being a new card, it's really an incredible option. You can get these for about $30 more on Amazon, but I think it's best to just get it from AliExpress if you're willing to wait a couple of weeks for shipping versus a couple days from Amazon. This RX 580 is great for 1080p gaming and with 8GB of video memory it means you're not going to be running into as many VRAM limitations as you would with a 4GB card. This is a Ming Zhou branded card and it features a dual fan design basic aluminum heatsink, and a metal backplate. It's using a cheap looking green PCB, but again, this card is under $70 and performs great. One caveat with this card is the fact that even though it is new, the RX 580 is a card that launched many years ago, so driver support may not be available for more than a year or two from now. With all that being said, this is going to give you so much more power than the integrated graphics you would normally find on a $400 PC build. The next part to talk about is the power supply. Power supplies are really expensive right now. After looking at all the options, the best unit I was able to fit into the build is this 500 watt 80 plus white rated unit from Thermaltake. This is the Smart 500 and for $40 it works well in this build. It features a non-modular design with ketchup and mustard cables, but it's reasonably reliable and offers more than enough power for the entire system. If you have a little more room in the budget, you could opt for this 500 watt 80 plus bronze rated unit from Seasonic with all black cables, which will be a better option, but if you don't have the extra money, the smart 500 watt used in this video will work fine. For the case, I went with the McCube 110 from Deepcool. This is a micro ATX case with a toolless tempered glass side panel, power supply basement, and a super clean look all for around 50 bucks. It does only have one case fan at the back, but for a budget build like this one, it works fine and you'll be able to see temps in the benchmark section of the video. Beyond this, it's very easy to build in and offers a decent amount of room for cable management. The final part is an optional one, but it's something most people don't discuss in build guide videos, and that's a Wi-Fi card. Our motherboard doesn't have built-in Wi-Fi, and while Ethernet is the ideal solution, some people just don't have that option. For them, I recommend grabbing this UBIT AC1200 dual-band Wi-Fi card, which comes in at only $20 and even offers Bluetooth support. It's very easy to install, and I'll be going over the process of how to do that in the build guide section. All in all, for $400, you're able to build a pretty powerful all-new part gaming PC right now, which is incredible and something that wasn't possible for a few years during the GPU price apocalypse. Obviously, there are a ton of ways you could have spent this budget, and if you would have done something different, let me know what you would have went with in the comments below. So now that you've seen all the parts and understand why I picked them, it's now time to show you how to put everything together step by step. This is a very simple PC to build and I'll be guiding you through the whole process. To build this PC, the only tool you're going to need is a standard Phillips head screwdriver, preferably a magnetic one. You're also going to want to have a big open area to work on and block out an afternoon to assemble and set up your PC. So with your parts in hand, workstation clear, and schedule open, it's now time to start assembling your new system. The first thing to get out is your motherboard. Open up the box, pull out the board itself, then under this cardboard pull out the I.O. shield. Now you can take the board out of the bag and put it on top of the box. Grab out your CPU and bring your attention to the center of the motherboard. Push down and out on this metal lever, it'll pop up just make sure it's fully hinged back. Now lift open the other part of the socket like this to expose the pins. Now take your CPU and line it up in the socket. You can either line the cutouts in the CPU with the cutouts in the socket, or there's a little triangle on the CPU and on the motherboard that you can line up. Either way, once lined up, lower it down, applying no pressure, it should just slot in. Once in, you can hinge back over this side of the socket, press it down lightly, the cover will pop away, then hinge the socket arm back down and under the hook like this. Now it's time to install the cooler. It comes with thermal paste pre-applied so there's no need to add our own. Take the cooler with the cable facing the top of the board and lower it down, lining up the pegs in the cooler with the holes in the motherboard. Once they're lined up and the cooler's lowered down, press each peg into place in a cross pattern. 
They should all clip in and the cooler should be secure enough that you can handle the board by it like this. Once that's done, grab the CPU fan cable and locate the CPU fan header right here. Bring the cable to the header and line up the notch in the connector with the bump out on the header and once lined up, simply press it in a place like this. Finally, to clean up the looks, you can try and bunch up slash tuck away the CPU fan cable like this. Once that's done, it means your CPU and cooler are successfully installed and we can move on to the RAM. We have two sticks and there are two slots so it's pretty simple. Start by opening up the clips on the ends of both of the slots, then you can grab your first stick of RAM and line the notch in the stick with the notch in the slot and lower it into place. Once your shirt's lined up correctly, press down on both sides until the clip snaps shut and the stick is secure in place. Next, just repeat that same process for the second stick of RAM and you'll have successfully installed your memory. Now bring your attention to the M.2 slot directly below the CPU cooler. Start by pulling the M.2 mounting peg out like this. Bring your M.2 drive to the slot and line the notch in it with the notch in the slot. You can now insert it at an angle like this. Once in, you can hinge down the SSD and simply press the mounting peg back into place like this. With that done, we are now ready to put the motherboard aside and pull out our case. One tip is to pull the box away from the case like this instead of trying to pull the case out of the box. Once out, you can unscrew the top and bottom thumb screws on the back panel, pull back on it and lift it away. Then you can untie and remove this bag here which contains all the screws necessary for building your PC. Now you can hinge out and remove the glass panel like this. Now with the case on its side, remove the top two PCIe covers by bending them back and forth until they snap off and also remove the third one if you plan on installing a Wi-Fi card. With that done, take your IO shield and orient it like this then lower it down to the IO cutout and press in each corner one at a time until they snap in and the IO shield is secure. This can be a little annoying but just keep at it until it's fully in place. Now take your motherboard handling it by the cooler and lower it in at an angle like this, then hinge it down lining up the IO with the IO shield and making sure you can see these standoffs beneath the motherboard holes. Now from your screw bag, grab out six motherboard screws that look like this and install one into each of the motherboard holes with the standoff beneath it. Order doesn't matter, just make sure they're all secure. Now you can lift the case back onto its feet and get out your power supply. Undo the bundle and set aside the 24 pin cable that looks like this, the PCIe power cable that looks like this, and the CPU cable that looks like this. Now you can re-secure the rest of the cables in a bundle with the twist tie we just removed. With that done, take the power supply with the fan facing down and insert it into the back of the case like this, making sure the holes in the power supply line up with the holes in the case. Now take four power supply screws that look like this and install one into each of the holes securing the power supply into place. You may need to hold it in the correct spot while screwing in the first couple of screws. With that done, we can now start routing cables. Start by taking the 8-pin CPU cable that looks like this and push it through this hole here. Now take the big 24-pin connector that looks like this and push it through this hole here. Now take the PCIe power cable that looks like this and push it through this hole here. Next, take the USB 3 case connector and push it through this hole here. Now take the HD audio block connector that looks like this and push it through this hole right here. Finally, take the tiny front panel cables that look like this and push them through this same hole that the PCIe power cable went through here. With that done, we can set the case onto its side and start plugging things in. At the top left of the case, grab the 8-pin CPU connector and make sure both pieces are pressed together, then line up the notch on the header with the clip on the connector and press it into place, making sure the clip snaps secure over the bump out. Now take your attention to the right side of the board, grab the 24-pin connector and line the bump out and the clip up and press it into place. Now directly below that, grab the USB 3 cable and line the bump out on the connector with the indent on the header and press it into place. Now we'll plug in the front panel I.O. starting at the bottom left of the board. Grab the HD audio cable and locate the HD audio header. Now with the HD audio text facing the bottom of the board, press the connector in a place like this. Now to the bottom right of the board, bring your attention to the tiny front panel connectors and the front panel header. 
Start with the power switch and plug it into these two pins right here, orientation doesn't matter. Then plug in the reset switch directly below that, again orientation does not matter. Finally, take the hard drive LED connector and press it into these two pins, making sure the positive is to the left. The last little cable to install is the back fan cable which installs into the header to the left of the CPU power connector and goes in the same way the CPU fan cable did. Then with that done, we are now going to install the final components, the graphics card, and the optional Wi-Fi card. Start by loosening, pulling up, and re-securing this little panel. Now unlock the PCIe lock on the top slot and grab out your card. Line the cutout in the card with the notch in the slot, line it up, lower it down, and press it into place. Now for the optional Wi-Fi card, take it out and plug in the USB 2 connector into it like this. Lower it down and insert it into the 1x PCIe slot like this, then plug in the USB 2 connector to one of the two USB 2 headers in the board like this, making sure to match the blocked out pin on the connector with the missing pin on the header. You may find it easier to install this before the graphics card, which is fine, but it's also totally doable in this order too. You can now re-secure that sliding panel and install two or three PCIe cover screws that look like this, securing the graphics card and the optional Wi-Fi card. Now you can take your PCIe power cable, line it up with the header on the card, and press it into place. With that done, you can put the PC back onto its feet and we can do the last thing before reinstalling the panels, which is cable manage the system. I start by pulling all the excess cable link to the back of the case. I push all the loose cables under the power supply basement, then neaten up the cable runs and tied down some of the cables with the included zip ties. I just made sure everything was flat, made sure the main chamber looked good, then reinstalled the back panel. For the glass panel, I just removed the back plastic, then reinstalled it just like this, then peeled off the front plastic. We're now ready to turn the PC on for the first time, but there's still a number of things to do before you can start downloading and enjoying games. The first is to install Windows, which I'll have some tutorials on how to do that in the description. Then you can download and install the drivers, which will also be linked in the description. Once your PC is up and running, you'll need to go into the BIOS by starting with the PC off, pressing the power button to turn it on, and then immediately smashing the delete key. Once in the BIOS, you can go to the memory tab, make sure the XMP profile is enabled, and press F10 to save and exit. With that done, you're now ready to start downloading and enjoying some games. Speaking of games, it's now time to run some benchmarks. I tried to test a bunch of popular and hard to run games, but make sure to leave your suggestions for other games I should test in future builds and videos. So without further ado, here are the gaming benchmarks.
As you can see, this PC is pretty capable for only $400, esports titles play really well, and most AAA games play at 60fps if you're willing to play around with the settings. Temps were also quite good, even with a closed off front panel. In terms of streaming, I tested three games including an esports title in the form of Valorant, an older AAA title in the form of Borderlands 3, and a hard to run AAA title in the form of Cyberpunk 2077. Valorant worked flawlessly with the average FPS still above 240, which should be more than enough performance for competitive play. In Borderlands 3, the average FPS wasn't much lower but the 1% lows were. It wasn't choppy or anything and still produced an enjoyable experience on both my end and the stream end. Finally, in Cyberpunk 2077, the FPS did dip into the 40s at time, but the experience was still super solid. If you're wanting to stream modern AAA titles, the system isn't ideal in my opinion, but if you just want to stream stuff like Valorant and Fortnite, this will work great. All in all, for $400, the system is offering a lot of gaming and streaming performance. There are some compromises, and that's just the nature of building a new system this cheap. But I'm interested to hear what you guys think of it. Leave all your feedback in the comments below. So yeah guys, I think this wraps this video up. These build guides are a lot of work, but if you keep watching them, I'll keep making them. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing, and as always, this is Matt from Tech by Matt, signing out.